Greetings, everyone uh, in the, the UAE. I, I miss seeing my friends in um, in Abu Dhabi and in um, uh, the, the UAE, but um, I'm happy to be here to speak to this conference again. It's always been a great conference, and thanks to Dr. Amen and Dr. Janae in particular. Um, so I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So today, I think this is an a excellent uh, bookend to Dr. Poland's uh, talk yesterday and his talk today about um, early onset infections yesterday and late onset infections uh, today. Um, because what I'm going to talk about is really the opposite, is how to avoid overusing antibiotics in the NICU, which is a major problem um, across the world. And so the learning objectives for today is really the opposite of what uh, Dr. Poland spoke about, which is to identify which preterm infants may be at the lowest risk of early onset sepsis. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the reliability of blood culture techniques to diagnose uh, true bacteremia, because we do, um, in most NICUs, treat a lot of what we call clinical sepsis. And then we'll identify some strategies to limit antibiotic exposure in the NICU. So I think Dr. Poland mentioned uh, these statements from the Committee on Fetus and Newborn in the United States uh, yesterday, uh, particularly the one about um, management of neonates born at greater than equal to 35 weeks. And, and I'm not going to talk today about um, bigger babies. I'm really going to concentrate on the management of babies that are born preterm and particularly extremely preterm in our NICUs. So one of the things to recognize is that, um, as Dr. Poland mentioned in his talk, is that while early onset sepsis is a major problem, and you can see this is showing the number of infection episodes in one unit, you can see that, that across the spectrum of ages that we take, take care of babies in our NICU, even though the overall number of episodes each day is low, you can see that in total, Babies over the first month of life um, have uh, a, a very significant risk of late onset sepsis, whereas early onset sepsis um, is, a, is a major problem, particularly in the, in the smaller birth weight babies. So I'm just going to start with uh, a uh, really an invented case uh, just to set the stage for what we're going to talk about for the next half hour. And I think that this is the type of incident that happens in our NICUs every day of the week. So it's 3 a.m. and the tiny infant is on mechanical ventilation and receiving parenteral nutrition via a central catheter. So you're called to the bedside because she is requiring more oxygen, her abdomen is distended, and her C-reactive protein is elevated. So you increase the ventilator support, stop her feedings, draw blood cultures, and begin therapy with broad spectrum antibiotics. Two mornings later, about 48 hours, the blood culture is sterile, but the infant is better, and the team asks you how long you want to continue antibiotic therapy. And you grumble to yourself about those unreliable neonatal blood cultures because the baby was sick and now it's better on the antibiotics, and so you go ahead and order a 10-day course of empiric broad-spectrum antibiotics. And I think in the past, most of us thought, sorry, most, most of us thought that, you know, after all, what can be the harm of continuing antibiotics? They're relatively safe in individual babies, and you just want to keep this specific baby safe. So we're going to talk quite a lot in the next several minutes about whether that statement is true. So antibiotic exposure in the NICU is, is one of the most common medication exposures uh, that we see, particularly in the very low birth weight infant. So treatment of culture-confirmed bacterial infection, as Dr. Pol Poland was mentioning in his talk, uh, in his talks, is of course of obvious benefit. But it's very common practice to administer antibiotics to preterm infants in the absence of culture-confirmed infection. And I think that this is based on three assumptions that many neonatologists have. The first is that blood cultures are not always reliable, because if we had 100% confidence in the reliability of blood culture to grow an organism, if it was present in the blood, then we would always stop antibiotics 
when cultures were sterile. And we worry about false negatives due to prior antibiotic expo exposure, particularly in the setting of early onset sepsis where the mother may have received antibiotics for chorioamnionitis. And we worry that that might make the baby's blood culture sterile, even if there are um, it, there is bacteremia. And we also worry that there could be false negatives in the light of critical illness. Now that goes with both early onset sepsis as well as the risk of late onset sepsis. When a baby is critically ill, we may not believe the, the blood culture when it comes back sterile. And we also have another assumption is that the risks associated with antibiotic use is predictable and manageable. We worry about drug toxicities to the individual infant. Obviously, there's a need for IV access, um, but we worry less about those drug toxicities and the, some of the drugs we use because we monitor levels. And we don't think that the individual baby being exposed to antibiotics is going to be a problem. And the third assumption I think we make is that antibiotic use, even in the absence of a known organism, has significant benefits to the individual infant. And that's the treatment of culture negative sepsis. Because if we didn't think that continuing antibiotics in the face of sterile blood cultures was not beneficial to the baby, clearly we wouldn't be doing that practice. And so I'm going to now talk about early onset sepsis risk and antibiotic administration in preterm infants. And the theme here is going to be again and again the use of antibiotics in the setting of negative blood cultures. And early onset sepsis is important because approximately 80% of antibiotic initiation in the NICU occurs in the first 72 hours after birth. So many babies are treated and many babies, as I'll show you in a moment, are treated for prolonged periods of time. So this is a study that um, looked at, at um, um, many hospitals across the country that was uh, first authored by Dustin Flannery, one of our faculty here at CHOP. And this just simply shows you the variation in duration of early antibiotic exposures across different NICUs, and these are in the United States. And pretty much every practice that goes on in NICUs across the country, ventilation strategies, use of different types of medications, you'll see the same sort of graphics, which is that there are uh, low users and high users but this degree of variation, this is um, percentage of ELBW infants receiving antibiotics for more than five days. And you can see it, it goes from about maybe 5% in one NICU to upwards to 80%, 90% in another NICU. And this sort of variation, I think, tells you that practice style is influencing the use of antibiotics, not so much the rate of early onset sepsis. And this was, I think, demonstrated in a study by Rachel Greenberg down at Duke, uh, looking at um, uh, centers in the neonatal research network in the United States. And this looked at variation in early prolonged, which was defined as greater than or equal to five days of antibiotic exposure in infants less than 1,000 grams. And on the bottom here is the, is the actual percent of early onset sepsis. And you can see there's not enormous variation here, but there's pretty significant variation um, amongst the different sites. And these are all academic NICUs across the United States. This is a mistake in the graph. This should be 30%. So it ranges from 30% to as high as almost 70% of babies being exposed to prolonged antibiotics. And you can see here, these three centers with the highest rate of antibiotic, prolonged antibiotic exposure. These NICUs have a higher rate of, of early onset sepsis, but here, this center has the lowest rate of culture confirmed early onset sepsis, but has one of the highest rates of prolonged antibiotic exposure. And so our practices are to expose um, lots of babies to prolonged antibiotics um, in the absence of culture-confirmed infection, which again is due to some of those assumptions that I presented earlier. So I think the important question is, is prolonged antibiotic therapy in unaffected VLBW infants truly harmless? And this was a publication from the Canadian Research Network, 
that looked at the antibiotic use rate, which is a way of normalizing, given the number of patients in patient days, how frequently antibiotics are used um, in an individual NICU. And you can see here that the estimated probability of mortality increased as the antibiotic use rate increased and higher antibiotic use rate or the AUR was associated with higher morbidity and mortality. And I think that this is confounded by indication, obviously, because the sickest babies are at risk for um, uh, death and morbidity, but they're also at risk for having prolonged antibiotic use. And it's very unusual in our NICUs for a baby to die without being exposed to antibiotics. But it brings up the question, is there a risk of dysbiosis or a change in the microbiome in these babies by prolonged antibiotic exposure? And that seems to be the case. Then when you look at the microbiome of babies who've been exposed to antibiotics uh, early, that it changes the microbiome to, towards more um, pathogenic bacteria. And while I'm not gonna talk about that in any detail, I think that there's lots of literature now about how there is a dysbiosis um, or, a, mal or a, a malfunction of what the normal colonization of, of the baby's um, intestine should look like um, with antibiotic exposure. And so I think that this study makes you pause to say, could there really be a harm in using antibiotics for a prolonged period of time in the uninfected infant. This is another study uh, that, that attempted to um, uh, take into account the early antibiotic exposure by correcting for severity of illness. And what they found was that each day of antibiotic exposure was associated with a 24% higher risk of death late onset sepsis or necrotizing enterocolitis. And again, even though this corrected for uh, severity of illness, it still may be confounded by indication in the fact that sicker babies are gonna get prolonged, more, pro more likely to get prolonged antibiotics. But I think again, it, it does suggest that there may be some harm in using antibiotics in babies who are uninfected. So the next obvious question I think is to ask, can we identify a group of extremely preterm infants who are at lower risk of early onset sepsis and therefore avoid empiric antibiotics? Most of the work as Dr. Poland mentioned um, in his talk has been focused on identifying the babies who are at highest risk of infection and knowing which babies to treat with antibiotics. And this is the converse. Can we identify a group of babies who are at the lowest risk of early onset sepsis and perhaps um, not use empiric antibiotics in that situation? So extreme prematurity and the risk of early onset sepsis, we know that premature infants are at high risk of early onset sepsis and are significantly higher risk than term babies. And because of that, most are treated with empiric antibiotics after birth. We know that the pathogenesis of early onset sepsis is primarily through ascending infection from the birth canal into the, um, into, into the uh, uh, amniotic cavity. And so the question that some of my colleagues here asked was that are extremely preterm infants who are delivered for maternal indications, cesarean section with membranes intact at delivery, there's no clinical evidence for chorioaminitis, at lower risk for early onset sepsis. And I think that that takes into account the biology of most cases of early onset sepsis, which require there to be access to the amniotic cavity to the bacteria um, to be able to cause an ascending infection, chorioamnionitis, and therefore infecting the baby. And if you can identify those babies, can they be safely managed without antibiotics after birth, um, even if there's some sign of illness? So my colleague here at CHOP, Karen Popolo, published this a few years ago. This was looking at um, data from, again, from the Neonatal Research Network. And she and her colleagues asked the question, if we did take those babies who were delivered by cesarean section, intact membranes, no sign of, of chorioamnionitis, 
um, what was their actual risk of, of infection? And these are babies who um, were delivered under different circumstances, rupture of membranes, vaginal delivery, et cetera. And you can see that there's a very significant difference between the, the incidence of early onset sepsis or death at less than 12 hours in the comparison group versus this group that's defined by the delivery circumstances. So the risk of infection is about 2% here and up to 15% in, the, in, this other, in this other group. And in this paper, um, she also looked at antibiotic use in ELBWs who were at low risk for early onset sepsis. And you can see these are the different network centers. These are the um, uh, incidence of sepsis and the incidence of prolonged antibiotics. And you can see again, there's, there's um, significant differences between the different sites. This is um, prolonged antibiotics, early onset sepsis, significant differences, but many, many babies are treated. And if you look at the data, the number of infants given prolonged antibiotics per early onset sepsis case for the low risk group was 66 and for the comparison group was 19. So lots of babies receiving antibiotics for a relatively low risk of, of, um, of sepsis. And so I think that may allow us to identify um, uh, babies who are born in our NICUs that may be, may be allowed to not be treated with antibiotics for an empiric period of time after birth. And this is uh, a suggested algorithm for sepsis evaluation in VLBW infants that we use in our birth hospitals here in Philadelphia. And um, uh, if there's uh, obvious signs of chorioamnionitis or there's a part interpartum fever, the babies get ruled out for sepsis. But then we, we stratify by the reason for preterm um, delivery. So if it's for a maternal indication, there's a C-section delivery without labor and rupture and no rupture of membranes at the, and there's rupture of membranes at delivery. If the baby does not require hemodynamic support, so we use signs of shock as a, as a clinical indicator, then we would provide routine care without antibiotics. And if there's induction of labor and a, and a subsequent vaginal or cesarean delivery, if the infant requires respiratory or hemodynamic support, the baby would get ruled out for sepsis. And if not, we again would, would elect not to treat that baby with antibiotics and just monitor very carefully. So this takes into account both the mode of delivery as well as the severity of illness after birth. And obviously many babies who are born very preterm may require respiratory support because of lung immaturity or respiratory distress syndrome. And so uh, those babies, when you can't differentiate critical illness from sepsis, would get treated with antibiotics. But there is a subpopulation that, that we think is safe to simply monitor without antibiotics after birth. So let's now shift to blood cultures in preterm infants and talk about reliability as well as time to positivity. So blood cultures are obviously a diagnostic standard for the presence of bacteremia. And current blood culture techniques rely on the production of CO2 or change in gas pressure to detect growth. And in most sites, these blood cultures are continuously and automatically assessed and flagged if there's a change in gas pressure to when there's growth in the medium. They're optimized to detect very low levels of bacteremia and most blood culture systems will detect bacteremia at a level as low as one to 10 CFU and a minimum of one ml of blood that's inoculated. And it's also true that culture medium in most modern systems include antimicrobial neutralization elements, which should make us confident that um, exposure to antibiotics in the mother may not um, disallow the, the possibility of blood cultures being positive in the baby. And this is a, 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 a systemic review of um, blood culture time to positivity in neonates. And the important thing here is, I won't go through each study, but the important thing here is in newborns, greater than 90% of cultures become positive by 36 hours of, of, in, in, of inoculation of the blood culture. This here, the study birth weight less than 1500 grams, you can see that 97.6 
a percent of the cultures were positive at 36 to 48 hours. And so pretty much across the board, 36 hours gives you a nine out of 10 that the culture is gonna be positive, you're gonna see it. And this gives us the ability to potentially stop antibiotics earlier by what, what's called a hard stop order set, which can be built into a computerized order entry or into written orders just to, just to institute a stop. And if you do stop antibiotics at 36 hours, for example, um, and the culture does subsequently come back positive, that would give you a very short delay in antibiotic administration if the culture did come back positive later than 36 hours. And this is another example of blood culture time to positivity by organism type. And you can see here that gram negative organisms seen here in the black become, if they're present, become positive very quickly, about 100% of them by 24 hours. Gram positives grow a little bit more slowly, but again, you're hitting 90% positivity by about 36 hours of, of uh, incubation. And so I talked briefly about this effect of an automatic 48 hour stop order or even a 36 hour stop order on the antibiotic utilization rate. And this was a study that, that looked at um, uh, IV antibiotic use in, in a NICU over, um, over time. And you can see when they instituted in their medical record or their order entry system an auto stop order where the antibiotics automatically got stopped at 48 hours if the cultures were negative. You can see that the antibiotic use rate dropped in a significant way um, just simply by adding in that auto stop, which makes it more um, activity on the part of the neonatologist to restart antibiotics. So let's shift and we'll talk about late onset sepsis evaluation in antibiotic administration since that constitutes a greater degree of, of actual sepsis in the babies and also in, is important for antibiotic use. So as Dr. Poland um, pointed out, late onset infections are more common than early onset sepsis in ELBW patients. And preterm infants are frequently started on antibiotics due to nonspecific signs. And in one study of in two different settings, um, looked at why antibiotics were started. You can see that there are very nonspecific. Feeding intolerance was the majority of time looking for necrotizing enterocolitis, increased respiratory support, increased apnea bradycardia, or the baby had an ill appearance. And obviously those can be associated with late onset sepsis, but many of those clinical signs are just the natural course of the preterm infant's clinical time in the NICU. And so what this leads to is that many uninfected infants are being exposed to broad spectrum antibiotics since we tend to use much broader spectrum antibiotics in the setting of late onset sepsis than early onset sepsis. Um, Bancomycin, um, at least over the course of the last couple of decades, has been one of the most frequently prescribed antibiotics for late onset sepsis in U.S. NICUs. And this is due to the prevalence, as Dr. Poland showed, of coagulase, ne coagulase negative staphylococci and the concern um, in many sites for methicillin resistant staph aureus. Um, vancomycin is frequently combined with broad spectrum antibiotics for gram negative organisms, with some examples down below in red. And again, this leads to many uninfected in infants being exposed to broad spectrum therapy. And that may have consequences on the local ecology of antimicrobial resistance and fungal infections. There certainly has been a correlation between use of broad spectrum third generation cephalosporins and the incidence of fungal infections in individual NICUs. So this is um, an example of um, the antibiotic utilization rate across US NICUs. And this is, um, again, looking at the incidence for late onset sepsis, sepsis evaluations. And you can see here, I'll, I'll just point out here that the, 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 um, the black line are regional NICU. So these are gonna be some of the academic centers across the United States. And you can see that there's a, that there's a fairly broad um, scope of the antibiotic utilization rate across um, different sites in the United States. And I think that that, that um, again, is not correlated with the incidence of late onset sepsis. And so um, what we'd like to see is the antibiotic utilization rate um, dropping um, and narrowing 
to, um, to when, so we not treating babies with negative blood cultures for clinical sepsis. Now, one of the things that is important though, and one thing that can be taking, that can uh, be a quality improvement project in your NICU is one of our fellows, uh, uh, Melissa Schmatz, uh, did a study in our CHOP NICU looking at the association of later onset time to antibiotics uh, when a decision was made to treat with antibiotics and the probability of, of, of uh, mortality. And you can see that, um, that the, the quicker the antibiotics were instituted in, this, in the setting of a concern about late onset sepsis, the lower the mortality. And so we've um, had a quality improvement project in our NICU over the last several years to try to reduce the minutes to antibiotic administration when the decision is made to treat with antibiotics. Um, and you can see that we've been successful in decreasing um, the time to antibiotics with our goal being um, 80 to 90% of antibiotics are administered within uh, 60 minutes of the decision to treat and evaluate for late onset sepsis. So Dr. Uh, Poland talked about the importance of hand hygiene and, and I'll, I'll reinforce this. This is that what we call in the United States, mom and apple pie, which is that nobody can argue that hand hygiene is not important. But there have been some studies that have actually looked at what happens with various degrees of hand hygiene compliance. And this is uh, one study that was done in a, in a newborn intensive care unit, looking at the acquisition rate of uh, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus with the rate of hand hygiene compliance. Because it's thought that Staph aureus, particularly MRSA, is more likely passed to babies through our um, hands when they're not clean. And you can see that there does seem to be, um, this is the rate of hand hygiene compliance here, and this is MRSA colonization rates. And you can see that in the times where there's less hand hygiene, there's more MRSA colonization. And most late onset infections occur through colonization of the catheters or colonizations of the babies. And so you are unlikely to get bacteremia unless you're colonized with the organism. And another study that also looked at hand hygiene compliance looked at the actual incidence of sepsis. And what they found here is that as hand hygiene compliance dipped, the rate of sepsis in babies less than 1,500 grams went up. And so I think this is a direct evidence that how we um, manage hand hygiene in our NICUs can have a downstream effect on the incidence of sepsis. And that's a very simple uh, uh, activity that can make us feel more confident and have babies less exposed to antibiotics over time when the sepsis rate is lower. So here's some practice recommendations that, that I've put together for the antibiotic stewardship in the NICU. Um, I think that um, uh, Rich um, mentioned this, but I think that it's important to obtain a minimum of one ml per pediatric blood culture bottle of blood. And um, that should be done routinely uh, because the, the likelihood that you're going to have a false negative blood culture is much lower with a greater inoculum of blood in the uh, blood culture bottle. I would recommend protocols for antibiotic use in infants at low risk for early onset sepsis, such as I showed you in that graphic from our birth hospitals. One could consider an automatic stop rule after 36 to 48 hours of, of blood cultures if blood cultures are negative, meaning that the computer system or the order stops the antibiotics, and I would recommend 36 hours rather than 48 hours given the time to positivity of most blood cultures, and then reassess if the blood culture comes back positive. Um, one should be reviewing at least annually your unit specific isolates to choose the least broad spectrum antibiotics for rule out. And that would include, are you screening for MRSA? So if you're screening for MRSA, then don't use vancomycin, use oxycillin as, as Dr. Poland noted for your initial antibiotics, use a less broad spectrum antibiotic. I think that NICU medical directors and uh, uh, the neonatologist should enforce restriction of prolonged broad spectrum antibiotics for culture negative sepsis. You should have a higher threshold for 
treating culture negative sepsis than I think we currently do in many NICUs across the world. And lastly, I didn't mention this, but there's some evidence that in very preterm babies, particularly those who receive uh, fresh breast milk, that some um, sepsis-like syndromes can be caused by acquisition um, after birth of cytomegalovirus. And so in many units, if there are uh, situations where you have a sepsis-like syndrome with negative blood cultures, you might think about doing cytomegalovirus testing, which could lead you to um, down a pathway of not using um, broad spectrum antibiotics in that situation. And lastly, I think when, when recommendations for when an infant becomes suddenly very ill, it's reasonable to use very broad, broad spectrum coverage, which might improve um, ceftazidine or cefepime, um, um, uh, amphotericin in situations where you have a large um, proportion of late onset sepsis caused by fungus. But when culture results are known, I think you should stop antibiotics where the cultures are negative and please make, generate that into your practice and use the narrowest possible choice of antibiotics when cultures are positive. So, so tailor your antibiotics to the sensitivities of the organism that you um, um, get out of your blood culture. And if you do choose to treat for presumed culture negative late onset sepsis, which many of us still do um, because of the critical illness of the babies, you should try to use the narrowest choice of antibiotics that you possibly can and try to avoid prolonged exposure of, say, to third-generation cephalosporins if you have a negative blood culture. So just my final slide, just to show you that, um, um, that antibiotic stewardship really can work. Um, what this shows is over, is over time, again, very broad um, spectrum use over lots of patients in the antibiotic utilization rate. And as antibiotic stewardship um, uh, activities increased, you can see these, um, uh, the antibiotic utilization rate narrowed. So you, the, it went down significantly in academic regional NICUs. And so I think that this is important that you can make a difference, you can make an impact through antibiotic stewardship and quality improvement work in your NICU. So with that, I will close and uh, thank you for your attention. And I do hope that I'll be able to see my friends and colleagues in the UAE in 2021 or 2022. And please, everyone listening, stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you for listening.